our dyslexic learners in particular, they know what it should sound like and they are bright and creative and they just may kind of make it up and it sounds really good. And so you don't quite realize the struggles. How can we see around the compensation strategies many neurodivergent kids use to mask weaknesses? How can we best utilize the accommodations available for dyslexic students? How can parents communicate with schools to advocate for those accommodations? And what strategies can students use to self-advocate? Today, we're talking with Jill Stoll. She's the founder and executive director of Stoll Learning Centers and the author of Take the Stone Out of the Shoe. We'll talk about stone removal today on episode 131. I'm Emily Kircher-Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Before we get started, I want to ask a favor. If you listen to us on a platform that allows you to write a review, would you do that? Apple Podcasts, of course, welcomes reviews, and those reviews help potential listeners decide to check us out. So if you get a chance, would you write just a real quick review for us? And if you haven't subscribed to our podcast via one of the available platforms, you can find a link on our website, neurodiversitypodcast.com. Look for the subscribe link at the top of the page. Our conversation with Jill Stoll is next. You're listening to the Neurodiversity Podcast. Gifted and special ed administrators and educators, we have officially released our new training course, Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. The course is hosted by Emily Kircher Morris and designed to help identify, understand, and educate our growing population of twice exceptional students. The course is a multimedia experience combining video elements, printable support documents, audio and video clips of experts in the field of gifted education, and real case studies. It's broken into six modules and comes in two versions, one designed so directors and administrators can conduct a classroom-style learning experience. The second version is for self-study, so participants can take the course on their own when it's convenient for them. The course is entirely in the cloud, and each module ends with a review quiz. Then a certificate is awarded that can be used to track continuing education credits. Once again, it's called Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students, and it's available now. Find the link in this episode's show notes, or go to neurodiversity.university. Or if you prefer, call the Neurodiversity Alliance at 929-445-8255. I am excited to welcome Jill Stoll to the podcast today. Jill is the founder and executive director of Stoll Learning Centers and is the author of several books. Her newest book is Take the Stone Out of the Shoe, a must-have guide to understanding, supporting, and correcting dyslexia, learning, and attention challenges. Jill, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. We are learning so much about neurodivergent brains. And you've been working with kids who think and learn differently long enough to see a lot of those changes that have been occurring over the years. I'm curious what it was that prompted you to write this particular book at this particular time. You know, with uh, the last two years with uh, COVID and kids working online at home parents really got a firsthand look at just how much their kids were struggling. And uh, when kids are struggling, there are two things that seem to happen. One is that people think because they're smart and they're capable in so many ways, people look at them and they think, well, you know, if they just tried harder, they would be able to do this. Or they're lazy or they don't really care. They're not interested. The other thing that happens is that the challenge is recognized. They see that they have a problem. They might get diagnosed with dyslexia or learning disabilities. But the common belief is 
well, okay, so you have this and you have to live with it forever, but we'll help you find ways around it. You're just going to have to live with it. And, and none of those things are really true. And so this has really been a message that I have wanted to put out there, have been putting out there actually over the last 35 years, that most learning and attention challenges, including dyslexia and auditory processing issues, can change. The, the challenges associated with those difficulties can be eliminated. And uh, so a big piece of, of this book, Take the Stone Out of the Shoe, is just getting the message out there to people that, you know, having a learning or attention challenge and just finding ways around it is kind of like running a race or playing a soccer game with a stone in your shoe. And it doesn't matter how many special lessons you have to run with a stone in your shoe, it's still going to be harder than it should be. So the first piece of it is the message that that can really change. And the other reason that I put this out is because parents and teachers were asking, well, what can I do to support struggling learners? And so I wanted to provide them with tools and activities and strategies that they could use right away, simple things. And then also, okay, you're saying this can be changed. What's the research behind it? So all of that is is in this book. I know this is not directly related to everything that's in your book, but there's obviously a correlation. There was an article in 2014 in the New York Times about the kids who had been cured of autism mm -hmm. and about how it's like, well... <laughs> <laughs> that's not really what it is. But but there's kind of this pulling between like, this is the way it is and it always has to be this way and we just have to work around it versus there are skills that we can build. And if there are mm -hmm. things that are causing distress to an individual, it's not that we need to force somebody to change just to fit in. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in order to live a fulfilling and successful life, there might be things that, that are really beneficial to to support, just like we teach kids anything. Right. We talk a lot about the underlying skills. You know, when you go to school, you're learning reading, writing, spelling, math, all different kinds of academic knowledge curriculum. So that's mostly what we think about when we think of learning. But truly, underneath all those academic skills are other kinds of skills, processing skills and neurodevelopmental skills and executive function skills that can be developed. And so if some of those skills are weak or inefficient or underdeveloped, then it's just going to make it harder to learn how to read or write or spell or apply what you know. And, and so we're really looking at, well, let's identify those skills and develop those because the brain can do that so that it kind of levels the playing field and the student really can work to their potential. I know one of the barriers for kids getting support, especially bright students, is that they are really able to compensate, especially when they're younger, and that can mask their difficulties. But eventually, that compensation kind of runs out, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, you talk about younger kids, you know, <laughs> young kids. First of all, so many of our students with learning disabilities or dyslexia are very bright, but they struggle with some aspect of, of learning, reading or, or something. So you get these bright little kids in first and second grade, they can just memorize the stories. And so they sound like they can do it. And parents might see you know, the parents sitting there working with them on their homework one-on-one -on -one can see, wow, they're really avoiding this or they're, they don't really get this. But it's not that easy to see in a whole group. The other thing little kids do is actually not just little kids. Our, our dyslexic learners in particular, they know what it should sound like and they are bright and creative and they just may kind of make it up and it sounds really good. And so you don't quite realize the struggles. And certainly as they grow, there are so many, so many compensations that they consciously or subconsciously use. 
I think one of them is they have such great background knowledge and so they can fill in the blanks. Absolutely. So if you ask them to read something, they might really struggle with that phonemic awareness. Mm -hmm. But then if you ask them comprehension questions, they can do pretty well because they can kind of fill in the blanks, put put the puzzle pieces together. Yes. Until it gets too difficult, until it's something that is beyond that background knowledge. And that's where we finally see it, but then sometimes have lost so much time in supporting them. Right. And some some students, I mean, that may be ninth grade, college, even post, you know, like a master's degree or something, where finally the demand gets so great, they just can't use their compensations well anymore. There are even people in the psychological field who will question whether or not somebody can really be dyslexic if they are in medical school Mm -hmm. and that it's never been diagnosed before. And there's just sometimes a misunderstanding about how nuanced that can be and and what that can what that can look like. Absolutely. Uh, Because and I think dyslexia is one of the trickiest ones because these very, very bright individuals. And and a lot of times they have really strong talents. So they may be really good, you know, at speaking or acting, or maybe they're great, you know, at, at just creating uh, solutions that nobody thought of or or artistic things. And so you just look at these talents and abilities and the quickness that they have in in other areas. And it just, you know, it's, it, it's incongruous. It just doesn't match, you know, to think that they really struggle. But I've known a number of people actually who have not discovered their dyslexia until they were in medical school. What are some of the signs that might indicate that a child is struggling? Like some of those things that indicate that something is brewing beneath the surface. So often what parents see is resistance, Mm. you know, they're just whiny and, and they, or they do everything they can to divert your attention or do something else. And so when you start to see that kind of resistance, yeah, they may be tired after school, you know, young kids often are, Um, but when it's a consistent thing, there's a reason for that. And if you just look and you just think, okay, it takes my child longer, things seem to be harder, and even with a lot of effort, you know, they make more mistakes or they get poor grades, well, that's an indication that there, there's something else going on. And it's not that they don't want to do well or lack of motivation. Yeah, People want to do well when they can, and they will. One of the quotes from a psychologist, Alfred Adler, was that all of life is a striving for perfection. Like basically he was saying that motivation is part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. Humans are motivated to learn and do well. To me, I take that and interpret that as if you see a child who isn't, then what's going on? Exactly. That there's a stone in the shoe. There's something else going on that maybe needs to be resolved. Right. Let's talk a little bit about some accommodations. Accommodations can be useful in in certain situations, especially to support kids at at school and at home. What are some of the most effective ways that we can use accommodations, aligning that with the long-term goal of trying to resolve some of those underlying skill difficulties? You really want students to be able to access the curriculum and feel successful. And so I, even though, you know, I have this mission to help parents and teachers understand that once we can identify and develop those underlying skills, students can, can just be more successful without all that extra help. But along the way, absolutely, I I think we do need to use accommodations and it depends on what is going to be most beneficial to the student. But some students you know, as you said, our dyslexic students have typically have great comprehension. If they are in a timed test, it's going to be really difficult for them to show that because they won't have time to read all of the information. So, you know, maybe they get their test read to them or they 
are allowed to come back in and have a little bit more time on their test. Even, you know, I've heard the suggestion that, you know, allow the parent to give the test at home where the student isn't under time pressure and then just you know, submit it back to the teacher if there isn't time to do it at school. So, so there's that. There's um, just really being aware. Auditory processing. If you take a student with auditory processing issues, they may really need to see the teacher's mouth. So, if you set that student back in the back of the classroom, they're not going to get enough input. Plus, the auditory frequencies kind of dissipate the further you get away. So so that student with auditory issues needs to sit in the front of the class where they get better input, where they can see the teacher better. Getting a copy of the notes or the homework, you know, that they have to do for that day, even though I always encourage that we want our kids to feel capable. So have your child try to write down things in their planner, but also provide a written, you know, a filled out copy or have someone check it. It's it's like we don't want to make them feel like they're not capable of doing things by not expecting anything, but uh, finding a balance there. When I work with with clients, a lot of times, if we're talking about accommodations, I feel like there's often this conversation that leads into if we accommodate kids, are we therefore enabling them, which I think is maybe a a false dichotomy in some ways. But Mm -hmm. ultimately, my thought is like, if we bring kids into the process and we talk about, okay, this is the accommodation, this is why there's the accommodation. Here's how we'll know if you no longer need the accommodation. You know, what are your goals? How can we move through this? I feel like that's a really powerful way to kind of put them in control And I don't feel like it falls into enabling. When it comes to enabling, I feel like that's when we as parents or educators are running around behind the scenes, doing everything for a student. Absolutely. Instead of coaching them along the way. And having them be a part of the process, I think, is, is really important. First of all, they do have a lot of insight. So we need to be listening to what they're experiencing and what they need. But if they are not a part of the process, you may really see some resistance on that. But if from a young age they are a part and and you keep checking back in, what do you notice? What is working here for you? What do we need to change? Um, and just, you know, you're building executive function. You're building a sense of power and ownership into the process. The framework that you've developed and used to support kids relies on a framework of underlying skills, like you've mentioned. So I thought it would be useful for our audience for you to describe what that continuum looks like. How do you conceptualize those skills? We think of it as a continuum that builds, kind of like a ladder. So if you think learning is like a ladder that builds, and up at the top, of that continuum or the top of the ladder are the school skills and the social skills and just the skills that allow you to be a really um, functional, successful human. And underneath the rungs there are supporting skills. And so we look at three major rungs on the ladder. At the very bottom, we have what we call core learning skills. These start with reflexes. Sometimes kids and adults even have primitive reflexes, reflexes they were born with that should have kind of matured or integrated way back, but they didn't. And so they cause kind of a a little neurological roadblock. You know, if you've got a reflex firing when it shouldn't, then it's, then it's going to disrupt efficient flow for you. And so core learning skills starts with integrating retained reflexes and builds the body control skills. And this is really, you know, so that you can move through your environment easily and effectively and and you can hold a pencil and move it across the page and you can, you know, have your eyes, you know, look at the board and look at your paper. So it's all of those visual and motor and basic auditory skills. Those are at the core learning level. And when there's disruption there, it's 
usually going to look like dysregulation or attention challenges. And then the next level up is processing skills. It's a little bit higher in the brain. Uh, it is things like auditory processing, visual processing, processing speed, language processing, and uh, memory, attention, a little bit more attention, focus skills. And of course, disruption there is going to make it so that it's difficult to get good information. So you, you can't comprehend well if you don't have good information to think with, or you can't read well if the visual input you're getting is not accurate. So it's the skills that allow us to get good information and, and, and assimilate it. And then the next level up is executive function, which is our personal manager you know, our ability to plan and execute and evaluate our actions. And so those are the underlying skills. And then we have basic academics. And once kids, you know, have got those basic academics, then they're off and running with all of the other kinds of curriculum. We have to have that foundational stuff first. Right. And there are so many different skills there. And every student has their own profile of strengths and weaknesses. So they may have many of those skills that are strong and working for them, but they, if they have some that are weak and inefficient, then they're having to compensate for those, and that just makes everything harder. I know another piece that can sometimes be difficult for families is related to communicating with the school. It can be hard for, for parents to communicate and advocate effectively. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you have any ideas what needs to happen on both ends, not just the parents, but also from the school to help achieve that common goal of supporting kids' needs and, and mm -hmm. for the school to encourage the parents to advocate and for the parents to feel comfortable and to know how to initiate and follow through with that process? You know, I think the biggest piece is education. I remember when I was, when I was a special education teacher, there was a teacher at my school who taught gifted kids, and she loved working with gifted kids, but she absolutely could not understand a child with a learning disability. And if they were smart, but they were struggling, she just could not understand that. She felt like they were not trying, and, and she was a little bit punitive about that. Yeah. And so I think we have to help people really understand. It is hard to understand when you're bright, you have a bright kid and they're not doing the work. What is that all about? Which is part of the reason I wrote my, my first book, At Wit's End, and certainly Take the Stone Out of the Shoe. Parents and teachers need to understand what these kids are experiencing and, and why these things are happening. I think for parents, um, a couple of things. One is they need to approach teachers as, as a partner, as someone who really does care and want to help their kids. They may not know exactly how, and they are super busy, but as a parent, I know if there's something wrong, if your child is struggling and in pain, you get really defensive, and that doesn't really help. So if we approach teachers as though, I know that you care about my child and you're really doing your best. And, and I would also say then parents need to help educate them about, you know, what their child is struggling with and what it looks like. I feel like sometimes parents are so worried about being perceived as a thorn in the side of the educators. Right. Or, or the flip side of that, they feel like the educators don't have their student, you know, their child's best interest. And and so it's kind of, right. you know, I think that there are definitely teachers similar to the one that you were describing that you worked with at one point in time. Like there are some teachers who don't really understand what that might mean for a, a child who, who learns differently. Mm -hmm. I think that's changing. I mean, I think that that's uh, encouraging. Mm -hmm. But from my experience in the schools and now being outside of the schools and with helping parents, I do wish that schools were a little bit more open and encouraging and inviting to have parents as part of that process. And I don't think that they're closed off to it necessarily, but I think they rely on the parents to initiate it a lot. Right. Unless there's a child who's really very obviously struggling, which a lot of times these kids aren't. I think that's true. And I don't 
think that there is a particularly strong invitation for parents to come and interact. You know, it's it's easy for teachers to get defensive also. And I have to say, for for teachers, you know, with boots on the ground, I think they really do care about their kids and they really want to do well for them. Agreed. They have so much that they have to do and so much coming down on them from above, from the people who don't have boots on the ground. And it's, I think it's really hard. I would just encourage parents, you know, it isn't your turf, but it is your child. And so to make it a point to develop a relationship with the teacher, and and I would start every conversation with something validating to the teacher. I know how busy you are, and I'm st- I really am grateful that you're taking this time. Or, you know, Johnny just loves the science project that you did last week. Something to to build some rapport at the beginning and then um, be really concrete. And, and one of the things, we just need to be careful that we're not placing great big demands on teachers that they don't have the time or the expertise to do. So come in with solutions that, that are doable or that you can support or, and Mm -hmm. try to find a way to, to meet both needs. What about student self-advocacy? Are there any specific tools that you find that are useful to help students learn to advocate for themselves? You know, I think that is huge. It's so empowering for the student. And honestly, if you start really young, it's so cute, you know, <laughs> uh, that that it kind of kind of gets gets the teacher on the child's side. Uh, we have a student, and uh, she was a guest on on my podcast, and she is just delightful. Um, she has auditory processing disorder, and and school has been very difficult because of it. And she got diagnosed when she was eight, and from that time on. She and her mom learned about auditory processing disorder, and her mom took her in to the teacher each year to explain to the teacher, helped her learn how to tell the teacher about auditory processing and what she needed. And of course, as a young child, they're not going to say very much, but they can share something that is difficult and something that would help or the name of of the diagnosis or something. So from a very young age, she and her mom went in and she advocated for herself with her mom's support. And as a high schooler, she advocates for herself with every teacher. And she gets, you know, (laughs) uh, mixed responses. Some of them just sort of blow it off and others are really, really helpful. But she is empowered by doing that. I find it interesting sometimes those kids who are pretty bright and say, you know, they have some accommodations through a 504 plan Mm -hmm. and maybe they really need them, but the teachers forget because maybe they're doing well enough that they don't remember that a student has a particular accommodation. And then if it's not an established process, if those kids aren't used to requesting that or or bringing it up or communicating that, um, sometimes I feel like they they choose to sit and suffer in silence rather than <laughs> rather than advocate. It can be hard to ask for that help. It can be really hard, and it makes you stand out and look different and feel bad about yourself sometimes. And so that's why, you know, when you were talking about the student being a part of the process, that's really, really important. I mean, if it's something that parents impose on them or teachers impose on them, they may resist that because it it doesn't feel very good to to be different. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, with the 504, 504 is, is, it's good, you know, to think about accommodations and, and get all of that in place. But honestly, it's probably the student and, and then the, the monitoring of the parent with the student, that's going to kind of make sure that that really happens. It's, it's easy to forget. It doesn't have all of the ramifications that an IEP does. Right. 
As we wrap up our conversation, my last question is this. If a parent stopped you and they just asked you for one tip or one idea that they could implement right away with their child, what would you suggest to them? Wow, that's really hard. (laughs) One tip. Um, You know, I think something that is really helpful is uh, helping your child to visualize. Executive function is a really big thing now. So many parents are concerned about executive function, and I think it (laughs) became really evident when kids were at home and having to manage everything. But part of comprehension, of planning, of following directions, of executive function is being able to visualize it and kind of picture like a movie what you're going to do or what the story was about or the process. And so just kind of stimulating that and helping kids, no matter what you're working on, to kind of picture it in their mind, that's going to build a great skill that will have a lot of uh, applications over the years. Wonderful. Jill Stoll, author of Take the Stone Out of the Shoe, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to chat with you. There's a careful balance that we have to strike when we are working with neurodivergent kids. We want to empower them through self-awareness to self-advocate and ask for accommodations. And we want to empower them by strengthening the skills that are more difficult for them. When I was a neurodivergent student, I relied heavily on excuses. Oh, sorry, I forgot my homework. I didn't take my ADHD meds. But eventually I realized, with some adult support, that if I wanted to pursue my goals, I was going to have to figure out something that worked. I had to develop the strategies that worked with my strengths and figure out the accommodations that I could implement on my own. I had to learn how to take the stone out of my shoe. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thanks again to Jill Stowell. Her book, Take the Stone Out of the Shoe, a must-have guide to understanding, supporting, and correcting dyslexia, learning, and attention challenges, is both amazing and quite possibly the longest book title in history. Find out more about Jill, the book, and more on the episode 131 page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Thanks to Katie, Bert, Sarah, Ronnie, and Amy. They are all new Patreon supporters who are helping us by making a small financial donation every month so we can keep the lights on. If you feel like you could help as well, you can go to patreon.com slash neurodiversity. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our social media and production assistant is Krista Brown. The executive producer and studio technician is me, Dave Morris. For everyone here, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is a production of the Neurodiversity Alliance.